dogs fetch us our papers, fetch us our slippers, and may soon fetch us a better map to the human genome. The directions for a human being are written in code, three billion letters long. These instructions tell our bodies how to live, how to grow, how to die. Researchers call this code the sequence. Mapping genomes. We've heard this term many times. In past segments, we've talked about mapping the human genome, the cow genome, fly genome, even the bubonic plague genome. But what does mapping a genome mean anyway? Why do we map species and what information do we get from the map? As researcher Elaine Ostrander knows, genetic science is a collaborative effort. Even her border collie Tess is pitched in with blood samples. After more than a decade of intense work, Ostrander and other scientists have used such samples to create the first map of the dog's genome. To map a genome means determining which gene sits in which chromosome and precisely where. That raises the question, why a dog's genome? Because, curiously enough, it will make the human genome easier to read. So dogs are a great model for, for doing genetics of disease for th really three reasons. The first is the families are big, so it's not unusual for a pair of dogs to have several litters of puppies, and over the course of their lifetime, they may have dozens and dozens of offspring. The second issue re relates to that as well, and that is you can often get DNA samples from multiple generations in a dog family. And of course, in humans, when you study a disease that occurs later in life, like cancer or Alzheimer's, maybe you can only get DNA samples from a couple generations in the family. So that gives us a lot of statistical power. But probably the the third and the most important issue deals with this issue of, of homogeneity. Homogeneity. Okay, computer, could you quickly explain the meaning of that word? I can explain it quickly, Lucky. You see if you can keep up. Homogeneous is defined as being of the same or a similar kind of nature, a uniform structure or composition throughout. But you also need to know that most of the genes found in people are also found in aardvarks and walrus, though the arrangements are somewhat different. That's why rats can be useful stand-ins for people. Same with dogs, but with a difference. Humans have an extremely large and heterogeneous gene pool from thousands of generations of almost random pairings by our ancestors. But for hundreds of years, humankind controlled the dog breeding to ensure specific traits. In the process, the dog's genetic sources have been reduced to a relative handful, so their genomes are more homogeneous than humans. Their maps are easier to read. Okay, so the dog's genome has fewer variables. Dogs still have many of the same diseases and disorders that plague us. Cancer, for instance. Dogs can get breast or kidney cancer or lymphoma. It is much easier in dogs to isolate which genes are involved in a disease because dogs have fewer genes than humans to look at. So all the things that we've put a lot of time and money into studying in, in human genetic disease studies, we see in dogs, and, and dogs are a great system in which to study them. That makes the task of genetic mapping infinitely easier to do. And you can't underestimate how much that buys you in terms of simplicity. And that's the reason we're particularly interested in tackling the genetics of complex traits in dogs. Ostrander and her colleagues are finding genetic markers or signposts on the genome, much like street names on a map. These signposts guide you to an area of the genome to find a gene linked to a certain disease. Before genome maps, finding the right area to isolate and study was just a shot in the dark. At Perligen Sciences, Kelly Frazier is developing a revolutionary technique to make the shot in the dark more accurate. With a library full of mapped species, she and her colleagues are using comparative mapping techniques that isolate target genes more quickly. They take note of the genetic sequences that different species have in common. Yes, I don't think it's done. These conserved sequences have remained largely intact over an evolutionary period, usually to regulate some vital function. It's important to compare the DNA sequences of many species with that of the human genome in order to help decode the human genome sequence itself. 
because the vast majority of sequences between the dog and human are different. So by looking to see what sequences they have in common, what sequences have been conserved, that gives us a hint as to what's been conserved because it has function. While Fraser is using the cow, pig, horse, and the dog to try to find similarities in species that developed independently of humans 70 million years ago, she also is looking for differences called diverged sequences. But to find these diverged sequences, she has to look to a closer evolutionary neighbor, the monkey. So when you look at this screen here, the top panel we have human, then we have chimpanzee, and then we have orangutan. And what we're looking for are patterns between the human, the chimp, and the orangutan that are different. And you'll notice that there's a block right here. And what this is indicating is that there's been a, about 2,000 base pairs inserted into the human genome since the divergence of humans and chimps, and that this sequence is human-specific. So by comparing multiple species, Fraser identifies clues that evolution has left behind, clues that could lead to the discovery of disease-causing genes and eventually drug therapies. We'll compare that region to see what's conserved between like humans and dogs. Uh, we'll compare it with RNAs to see well, what possibly gives rise to proteins. And then we'll look to see, well, is there anything different in that region between humans and chimpanzees? And then we'll use this information to look in that region and see, is there a good target in there for a drug? And this will eventually lead to improved pharmaceutical drugs for people who have that common disease. Dr. Emmanuel Migno has shown that the system can work. He and his students and colleagues at Stanford University have found the gene for narcolepsy with the help of genetic maps. Narcolepsy is a disease that causes people to feel overly sleepy and in some cases to fall asleep suddenly and uncontrollably. It has, among other things, led to deaths in automobile accidents. It strikes one in every 2,000 people. For some who have it, even enjoying a good laugh is difficult. <laughs> I love comedy and love to have a good time, but I would never go to a comedy club and sit in the table in the front row, even now, even though I'm well treated, because it would just be too embarrassing to have cataplexy in a, in a public place like that. Over the years, that with living with the symptoms of narcolepsy, I, I found that my world became smaller and smaller. But finding the gene for narcolepsy in humans proved difficult, so Dr. Mignot turned to his narcoleptic Doberman pincer, named Prancer of all things, to help him find the gene in dogs. He guessed at the right chromosome and searched for the marker and ultimately found the narcolepsy gene. In humans, I just couldn't solve it because in humans, people have narcolepsy, but you have no clue why. That there is no genetic basis. That's very clear. Whereas in the dog, it was purely genetic, a single gene. Then I knew that in dog, it could take maybe 10 years. And in fact, it took 10 years to find a gene, but I knew there were genes somewhere to be found, and it was just a matter of being persistent and looking and looking. And we think that he found it, and it turned out that by finding the dog gene, it gave us the answer for the human disease. Then that was really amazing, because the finding the dog gene solves the human problem. Had both human and dog genomes been mapped when Minio started his search, it would have probably taken only a fraction of the time and effort for the researchers at Stanford to find the gene responsible for narcolepsy. It's a bit like knowing that somewhere in the United States there is one person you are searching, but there would be no map, no cities, and you just have to find this person. If we had a map, we would have been able to say, let's see if it's in California first, or in Arkansas, and then in California, is it in San Francisco or San Jose, and, and zoom it down much faster. So the way we had to do it was much more random. While Prancer was a great help, what people like Ostrander and Fraser had already learned was critical to the process of isolating the narcolepsy gene. 
Dr. Minyo is one of the first people to use this new mapping tool to solve a disease mystery that has made life so difficult for hundreds of thousands of humans. And he has helped man's best friend in the process. I guess the point to be made is there are now dozens and dozens and dozens of labs throughout the world thinking about different diseases that are doing the exact same thing. But they all start with the map. The cat genome is currently in the works. Stay tuned for an update. Meanwhile, the dog genome does seem to be uncovering many genetic mysteries. Hopefully, they will be able to find and turn off the gene for digging up my favorite flowers. The Secrets of the Sequence teaching materials were developed at Virginia Commonwealth University with funding from the National Academy of Sciences and the Pfizer Foundation. The original public television series, Secrets of the Sequence, was produced by Ward Television with funding from Pfizer, the Pfizer Foundation, Oracle, and the Council for Biotechnology Information. Special thanks to member institutions of the series advisory board, consisting of Virginia Commonwealth University, Harvard University, University of Wisconsin, University of Michigan, University of California at San Francisco, and the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology, Cambridge, England.